wanted to introduce Rick Holly and his mother from Baldwin, Calland, Wisconsin. And this is Toots Holly. She has been here before, but it's been a couple of years. And Rick has done a presentation before. And today we would uh, like to do another presentation for you. million American men and women served their country during World War II. Of that number, 11 million served in the Army. Of that number, 24,000 served in the Airborne. Of that number, 12,000 served in the 82nd All-American. Of that number, we're going to talk about eight soldiers. Corporal Leon Holly, Private Harold Husk, Private Charles Ressler, Corporal Paul Snyder, Sergeant Stokes Taylor, Lieutenant Jake Wardick, Sergeant Bernard Wilson. Between these eight soldiers, they fought fierce battles and covered a lot of ground. We have a map here from North Africa. They fought the Battle of Sicily, on to Italy, then to D-Day, northern France, Market Garden, up in Holland, and Battle of the Bulge. From the crucial day in August 1942, six of these men stationed at Camp at Claymore, Louisiana, stepped forward and volunteered to join up with Colonel Gavin's 82nd Airborne to VE Day, May 8, 1945. Only one of these eight soldiers would live to see their hard-fought victory in Europe. Rick is going to take us along the actual footsteps of these eight brave soldiers. Not really so unlike the other 16 million soldiers, airmen, sailors, and marines of World War II. These were men who were asked to do the impossible, stepped forward and said, sign me out. Let's start with the timeline. Rick? March 1942, uh, my dad was at uh, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Uh, he enlisted like thousands and thousands of others. And, uh, Commanding General was General Omar Bradley. That was March 1942. In June 1942, Bradley went up to be Eisenhower's right-hand man. And the assistant, uh, or the number two man in the, the 82nd Division was not airborne yet. It was still light division. Uh, it was Matthew Ridgway. And Ridgway took over. And in August of 1942, uh, prior to that, around June, uh, George Marshall, Secretary of the War, seen what the Germans had been doing over in Europe. They, were, they had formed the airborne. They used paratroopers and gliders to take the island of Crete, the lowlands in Holland, and all, also invade Belgium. And Marshall turned to uh, Eisenhower and said, I want to form a new unit called the airborne. And Eisenhower said, let me talk to, to uh, General Mark Bradley. And Bradley said, I have just a man. He contacted Matthew Ridgway. And Ridgway said, I'll do it under one condition. I choose my own men. So August 1942, uh, the men of the uh, 82nd Division were asked to step forth, step forward in those there. They formed the 325th and the 3, 326th Glider. The 326th 
glider regiment would go over to the 101st Airborne. So now they start forming the 82nd and the 101st. Meanwhile, there were parachute schools and there were regiments being formed. The 504 and the 505 became part of the 82nd Airborne. The 502 and the 506 became part of the 101st Airborne. So now we have two parachute regiments and a glider regiment. And then uh, Matthew Ridgway uh, worked with a young man by the name of General or Colonel James Gavin. Gavin was of the 505, and they studied what the Germans had been doing, and they realized that we have no artillery weapons. All we have are machine guns and bazookas. So out of the 325th Glider Regiment, they brought in what they called the 80th Battalion, and they brought in a 57-millimeter anti-tank gun in by Goliath. That came out of the 325th Glider uh, Regiment, and they formed what they called the 505 Regimental Combat Team. They made up of the 505 paratroopers, 307 engineers, guys who blew up stuff, 307 medical team, and the 80th Battalion, which was only a small battalion, only 280 men, six batteries, and a headquarters battery. And that's where these six men originally started off. Two of the men were not there yet, Charles Ressler and Private Harold Cuss. They would come in later. But the six men started out, and uh, when they trained, Gavin and Ridgway were uh, very athletic. They were runners. And they also realized, okay, we don't have large amounts of artillery, we don't have tanks, so our uh, message to our men, we're going to have to fire, maneuver, and outflank. They were light infantry, and they'd have to do it faster than anybody else. So Gavin and Ridgway, they became very close, and they really pretty much wrote the airborne training program. They also did one other thing. They practiced in the dark. In places like Camp McCall, Camp Claiborne, Fort Benning, Fort Bragg, they did all their maneuver in the dark because they realized it's exactly what the Germans did, and that's, that's exactly what they have to do overseas. They trained that way all winter long, and finally in April of 1943, they left the United States. And they landed at Casablanca, North Africa. And they traveled 700 miles by train to a place called Cairo, Tunisia. And in Cairo, Tunisia, they had five practice jumps, all of them in the dark again, because they were going to be part of the Captain Seventh Army and invade Sicily. In the first week of July, the first man out the door was Colonel James Gavin, the five fighter. And he stood, before he went, he stood on his jeep and he said, I will not send you men to Sicily. I will take you there. And that was Gavin. The very next night, on July 10th, 504 regiment would be going into Sicily. But the problem was the winds were strong from the night before. And they only had enough C-47 to bring one regiment in. So on July 10th, when they came in, 504, uh, they postponed their air, uh, leaving North Africa a few hours. And uh, the naval unit was opened up and they shot down 23 C-47s, uh, 16 men per C-47, 168 men drowned for sure, there are others missing in action. Uh, the very next night, July 11th, uh, the men of the 80th Battalion, which were the six men, they were <coughs> on the tarmac, loaded in their gliders, and Ridgeway canceled it, because he wasn't sure of the communications between the Army and the Navy. Instead, those six men went on the very next day into Sicily by landing craft. And basically by that time, they were kind of on the tail end of Patton's Seventh Army. And basically the 325th Glider Regiment, the 80th Battalion, uh, covered 150 miles in six days. They walked. And they pretty much ate Patton's dust. And they never fired a shot. But the 82nd Airborne, uh, under uh, Gavin and uh, Ruth Tucker of the 504, they would need 1,055 replacements after system. And there were a lot of commanders wanted to cancel the airborne after that. They figured it was just not worth it. It cost too much money, as you can see, but that said otherwise. Those men were scattered behind those lines, like all over, and the Germans had to deal with them. They were not right behind the beaches. The Patton said, wherever those fair troopers landed, the Germans didn't head to the beaches, right? They pinned our forces right off the beach. So they had to deal with them. Patton really had to had a lot to say if the airborne operation would continue for the next operation. And this pretty much shows landing at, uh, is it Gela or Gela? Gila. Gila, 
Sicily. And the blue line is where the Americans went. The red line is where the Brits went um, in this battle of the Husky. And they all wanted to get to Messina, of course, so they could get to the end of the boot, the boot of the boot. Again, here's Sicily. And the map of Sicily and it shows you what, where the Germans were um, and what was going on and where they had to go from the south, North Africa, through Sicily, up to Italy. Next up, first week of September, the 82nd Airborne was to land in Rome. Actually, uh, General Marklock was head of the 5th, 5th uh, Army, and they were going to land in Salerno. And they looked at uh, the beaches behind Salerno, and Ridgeway wanted the gliders and the paratroopers both to go into Salerno. The, the train was too rough, so instead they changed the drop to Rome, which was north of Salerno. But the intelligence of uh, General Mark Clark found that the Germans had surrounded the fields of Rome, so they canceled the operation. Instead, General Mark Clark went into Salerno, and uh, there was a lot of things that happened in Salerno and Sicily that uh, their mistakes were made, but they had to be that way because uh, we needed experience for our troops before we dared try Normandy. And uh, commanders made mistakes, they also learned to correct mistakes. One of the problems at uh, Salerno was that there were a pair of German 88 guns that were shelling the beach. You're up in a mountain pass. So it's another thing that had to be uh, corrected. But on September 9th, uh, on the sec evening of the second day, Salerno had been stopped. And they actually there and made plans for on the very next day at noon to start evacuation. And that's when Mark Clark called uh, General Matthew Ridgway and he said, uh, could you drop behind these forces, the German forces, and maybe break through? And uh, Ridgway answered with two words, can do. So the 504 and the 505, now they have the Su-47 to drop both of them into Italy. And uh, Colonel James Gavin again was in the lead plane, first man out the door. And the 325th Glider Regiment and the 80th Battalion came in on landing craft at 4 o'clock in the morning. And it was just enough to crack the German forces and push through. Uh, but two of these men, uh, Corporal Ian Holly and uh, Sergeant uh, Taylor, they actually volunteered for what they call the 6615th Ranger Force, which was, Dar which was uh, Darby's Ranger. And what they did on the nine miles north of Salerno was a little beach town called Mayor. And what they were to do was go ahead, climb up the Tunes the pass and knock out these two radiates of their shelling the beaches. It was a very valuable uh, piece of information. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to read this. While the main Allied offensive against the Italian mainland unfolded in Salerno in September 1943, U.S. Rangers, uh, Stokes and Holly, in this group at that point, under the leadership of Colonel William Darby, were entrusted with a vital task of securing the westernmost section of the Allies' beachhead. After landing on the narrow shore of Maori, 12 miles west of Salerno, they dashed six miles inland and seized the strategic 4,000-foot-high Chinese Pass overlooking the plain of Naples. And again, Rick and I were talking, you don't hear too much about that battle, but it was absolutely essential what they did. And here you can see, this is the town of Maori, and look at the, the mountains where the Germans were entrenched in that point. And this is where the Rangers had to go. And this is a quote that the Rangers had to endure 18 days of rugged fighting at Chinese Sea before the Allies could begin their main drive to the gap toward Naples. Outnumbered 8 to 1, they beat back seven large scale German counterattacks and held out against round-the-clock mortar and artillery barrages that forced them to live in cramped foxholes, hack into the mountainside. So effective were the Rangers' operations in the past that captured Germans' layers that their officers had estimated that a full division of Americans had held them tight. Here's some pictures. 57 millimeter on the bottom and the officers looking to see how they were doing. 
Here's some pictures that I thought were very quick. And Rick, where is this uh, operating room? This is the Santa Monica Church. And my father had a book. And the page was tipped over at the top. And I never, I found those uh, books after my father passed away. And I always wondered why we have a book like that. And it's the 10th British Field Hospital. And at Santa Monica Church, a man by the name of Captain Schuster did the surgery there. I'm assuming this is the same church. Correct. There were a lot of casualties. I never could figure out why my dad got a postcard from New York, Italy. And then I also found out that my father also had a presidential unit citation signed by Colonel William Garvey of Army's Rangers. And I never heard about two I used to pass before two in the past. And the interesting about it is that you won't it's difficult to find because the only really report is called the Leavenworth Papers, and it's an unofficial ranger report because of the 280 men, none of the officers, all the officers that have either been killed or wounded. It's an unofficial ranger report, and that's why it is very little written about. So that made way for what these rangers did up in the mountainside, made way for Naples to be taken, the first major European city taken back from the Germans. November 1943. The 82nd Airborne is transferred to Ireland. Uh, <coughs> let's see, we're down to about four of those men to go. I think that would be Wilson and uh, Apicella. Uh, let's, see, uh, let's see, two of the other guys would be transferred to Ireland. But my dad and Corporal Taylor would stay with uh, the Rangers. Uh, the 82nd Airborne, all would be transferred to Ireland. And then on December 1st, I no, oh, January 1944. My dad would go in Danzio Beach. And uh, Taylor and Holly would be with that. Dad would be wounded. And uh, after that, I really don't know. Uh, there's a lot of time there. I kind of uh, lost track of my dad. I can't find anything. All I know, I do have a picture of my dad uh, prior to Normandy with the first Allied Airborne patch. So sometime he was transferred. Uh, Sergeant Taylor stays uh, with the uh, 6615th Ranger Force, and the 504 would anchor the extreme left flank at, at Anzio Beach. And during this time, Private Harold Husk would be brought in to replace the Corporal of Holland. I wanted to read this quote. This uh, quote was found in the diary of a German officer who opposed the 504th on the Anzio Beach. He said, American parachutists, devils, and baby pants are less than 100 meters from my outpost line. I can't sleep at night, they pop up from nowhere, and we never know where or how they will strike next. Seems like the black-hearted devils are everywhere. Let's see, uh, on February, uh, the 82nd Air Corps be transferred to Leicester, England. But uh, prior to uh, that, when my dad was wounded, the, the 82nd Airborne, or Airborne and Rangers are what's called specialized forces. They could always rejoin their unit any place. Uh, other work, other soldier, soldiers would have to go to replacement depth. So that was the difference. Somehow those guys took the ride. Taylor and Holly made it to uh, Leicester, England uh, for the preparation for heat. And that took several months. While they were in Leicester, England, uh, believe it or not, the Brits were quite thankful. Uh, they even had special days salute the Soldier Week. And these are some of the pictures we found where they would be parading up and down the streets of Leicester, England. And um, all through southern England, actually, because they want the Americans more or less took over uh, southern part of England at that point. Prior to Normandy, uh, let's see, in December, General Matthew Ridgway was brought to England, and he would be 18th Airborne Corps, uh, which meant he was head of the 82nd and 101st Airborne, and he brought Gavin along with him, with him, and the two men planned the airborne operations for the Normandy invasion. Uh, the two men got along real well, uh, and they were just so uh, particular about everything. There's a real famous photo just before Normandy of Eisenhower meeting with uh, 101st Airborne. And uh, Gavin and Ridgway declined to have an Eisenhower come visit. He thought it would be a distraction for the men. Instead, he invited General Matt, or uh, General Omar Bradley, who was 
the commanding general of the 82nd two years before. And he walked through and just shook their hands, men. And one of them, enlisted men, told uh, Bradley, don't worry, we'll cover this end of the operation for you. And I thought that was just prior to Normandy. Uh, the first man out the door, one more time, is Colonel T. Or by that time, Gavin had become a general, sometime during, during those winter months. And uh, actually, just prior to Normandy, uh, let's see, six days prior, uh, the 82nd and 101st Airborne changed landing zone. They were going to try and cut off the Sherbrooke Peninsula. There were four divisions up there. So basically what they did, uh, they moved the 101st Airborne a little bit south and moved them closer to Carantan or Omaha Beach. And they moved the 101st over towards St. Mary Police. And uh, like I say, the first man out the door again was Gavin. Uh, he brought in the 505 and the 507 and one more Regiment 1 to 508, and the first fighters to come into Normandy at 4 a.m. was uh, Headquarters A&B Batteries at 88th Battalion, uh, 52 glider away from the Six landed intact, 23 destroyed, five missed. That information was given to me by a man, my World War II veteran, Ray Fari, took me overseas three times. This is a picture of, of them getting ready to take off uh, with the C 47s in England. That was the 325th Glider Regiment, and they came in, came in on the evening of the second day. Second day. Again, these pictures that we are showing you right now, Rick and his mother found, oh, about five, six, seven years ago, in the attic of their farmhouse. And they had the pictures developed, and we're seeing some very rare pictures that were taken by these 82nd Airborne guys uh, of the gliders. Correct. In 2010, we found a female in the house was sent home by my dad, sent home in 45, uh, 17 photos, and uh, the men were in Naples, Italy, uh, Leicester. Uh, they have men uh, glider pictures for Normandy and Holland and Beijing. Uh, the second man on the left, he made a report. Uh, my dad's way on the left. The second man was uh, Tech Sergeant John McFadden. He made a report to Colonel uh, Dan Van Wert and uh, General James Gavin at 7 a.m. outside the set. Uh, St. Eric Lease, and he told, them, told the two uh, officers that we have recovered six of the 24 anti-tank guns, five of the 11 jeeps, 26 of the 40 A battery men have been killed or wounded, and 21 of the 40 D battery men have been killed or wounded. And the reason he made it report all the officers who have been killed or wounded themselves, he was the highest ranking officer. So, that man's name is uh, Sergeant Lonnie Smith. My dad is uh, on the left there, and that's kind of an interesting photo. World War II, Ray, ba Ray Fari from Indiana took me overseas three times, and he told me this is just before they, lo they loaded into uh, uh, a glider. And two of the men are, as you can see, he said would be classified as out of uniform. Man on the left, man far on the right, Bill Jackson. And notice down on the right leg, uh, they have their uh, trench knife uh, tied. But however, just before you get into combat, you're allowed to take the top uh, cord or the top uh, uh, band that, that ties your trench knife, and you can replace it with a condom. That way, when you exit the glider, you have your weapon in your left hand, and you reach down with your uh, right hand and grab that trench knife, and you can break that condom and exit the glider faster. Those four men uh, never made it through Normandy. Ray never recognized them. Same thing with those four men. That, they're actually standing in front of a British camel car. And this is the condition of many of the liars when they came down with and planes. Lapierre Bridge, we talked about that. That was one of the main targets on the first couple of days of D Day. And this bridge, both Rick and I have been at this bridge, and it's probably about 60 feet long, 25 feet wide, and it was the point of the first couple days. If this bridge wasn't taken, D-Day would have been not successful. If you ever go there, the 325th Glider Regiment plaque says 31 men, 31 men made it across the bridge, 270 killed and 714 wounded. Over this little bridge. This is the condition of some of the German tanks that tried to come across the bridge and luckily the uh, were they 57 millimeter or bazookas they got them? Right, there was a 57 millimeter anti-tank gun. The problem was uh, it was 
back further, and uh, the seven men who manned it were all killed, but they were not EDF men. They were all engineers from the 307 engineers. So they did stop the Germans from coming across that bridge. Sadly, June 16, 1944, four of the eight were killed. Corporal Anthony Apicella, Private Harold Husk, Corporal Paul Snyder, Sergeant Bird, Wilson, all killed in the same battle. Rick, you want to tell us about this plaque? There's a plaque uh, uh, hanging above the door of the anti-tank gun uh, was placed. Uh, actually, all four men were sent with an anti-tank gun across the bridge and was sent by Colonel Ben Vandenborg on June 16th. Uh, next photo, I think, will uh, that photo there was taken by the World War II photographer Bob Kappa at a place in Botine de Silla Street at, uh, in St. Sauvaire, about 15 miles from St. Mary at least. And tell us about the, um, the helmet. The helmet belongs to Private Harold Tusk. Uh, the man who took me overseas, uh, his name was a World War II veteran, uh, Ray Farr from Munster, Indiana. He said he was a replacement for Normandy, and he got there just a few days uh, before this happened. And he was sent there to pick up the anti-tank gun with a uh, man by the name of Corporal Aaron Kemble. And they backed up the anti-tank gun, and the trails weren't even uh, anchored down yet, and the rear sight was missing. But Ray said we backed up, hooked up to it. The last thing Ray said I did was go over and pick up the helmet and said, Private Harold Huskett, who said I put it down. Uh, and that private, uh, or, uh, Harold, or uh, Ray Farr is up in the right hand corner there. That was about the 60th anniversary of D Day. Uh, on the 70th anniversary, Ray would take me over there, and a man by the name of Professor Robert Fouillet, who's a, uh, a retired history professor, the man in the middle, uh, took me into the house where that plaque was held, and he showed me the, private, or the helmet of Private Harold Huss. That was a man who replaced my dad when my dad was, uh, had been wounded in Italy. So how did he happen to keep this helmet? It's, there's a C-47 club over there, and the, the man in the middle is uh, uh, Professor Robert Fovier, and uh, they have a lot of artifacts that they don't let out. So in the heat of battle, then the locals just went out? The locals got it, okay. yes. And there's a lot of things over there that uh, you're kind of wary of some Americans. That man in the middle grilled me pretty good when I was there, to make sure I wasn't just a, a glory um, just after D-Day, this is the summary. On June 6, June 6 1944, 12,000 men of the 82nd Airborne began the liberation of France at the village of St. Mary in Glise. 33 days later, General Eisenhower met with the men of the 82nd at Leicester, England. There were less than 5,000 present. Many of the men were just from the gliders uh, injury because of broken leg, broke, you know, but these young guys healed up This is a quote from Captain Charles Mason. 33 days of action in Normandy without relief, without replacements. Every mission accomplished. No ground gained ever relinquished. Next panel. Operation Market Garden. Uh, September, uh, this is the British, under British control, the 82nd Airborne, the 101st Airborne, and the British 1st Airborne. All went up, and uh, the 101st uh, was given the op We were given the two bridges of Eindhoven and Sand, the first 20 some miles, and the next 25 miles was under uh, the 82nd Airborne, and they had Broad Bridge and the Bridge of 90. We did a presentation on this a while ago, too, about a year and a half, a couple of years ago, and this shows about an eight, 70 or 80 mile spans, and you can see the bridges along the way. And again, this was called the Battle of the Bridges. Um, the British Corps. Tank Corps was at the very southern end, down by Belgium. They had to proceed up as the airborne was simultaneously being dropped all along the way, the 101st to 82nd, the first British uh, uh, airborne. Problem was, this is the lowlands. They got stuck. They ended up on Hell's Highway. They couldn't move. It was not a really well thought out panel. But the 82nd Airborne again landed at the, the heights of Grosbeek, and they were able to uh, liberate, uh, go into the Navy, liberate the bridge 
without losing the bridge. A couple of years ago when I went over there, Rick had just discovered his the photographs of the attic that his dad had sent home in 1944, 45. And he said to me when I went over there, see if you can find this place. I've got a couple of pictures. So I went to Grosse Peak, where the 87th landed back in, 19, in September 17, 1944. I went into the museum and showed him these pictures. And without a, skipping a heartbeat, they said, we know exactly what that is. Grote Market. So I immediately went over to Grote Market. And sure enough, the picture up on the right-hand side is on the left. You can see the picture that Rick had given me that his father had taken just as after they had landed, gone into uh, Nymagen, and then on the right, the way it looks today. So when Rick and his wife went over, what, last September, that is them standing at that very spot where his father stood in 1944. This depicts the Wall River Crossing. Again, that was the bridge at Nymagen that was so essential and how uh, the 82nd Airborne had to take that bridge and how they got across the river on canvas boats, literally. And they did lose 47 men along the way. And they made the bridge intact. Uh, Grote Mark is, is to the left of the, this Nymega bridge, about 400 yards. It's in between there and the highway bridge, which the, uh, or the railroad bridge, which uh, 82nd 504 men crossed in the boats. And uh, I asked Ray Fari, the, the World War II veteran, I said, what's with that camera my dad? And he said, well, your dad was on a machine gun squad part of the headquarters. He would not have carried the camera, but he, it was probably under the seat of a Jeep. And in the Grote Market picture, there is a photo, and it's not a Jeep. Right in the right-hand corner, you can see the front end. It's a Dodge weapons carrier. And what they did, Grote Market is a perfect place for the men to bring in uh, weapons, ammunition, load up the wounded, turn around and go back. And many of the streets of Nine Bay Mary's Bend are single, very narrow, single road. So, uh, it, like I say, it's about 400 yards and, uh, from that bridge. So it was rather interesting. When we were over there last fall, uh, for five days, we never started a rental car. They took us everywhere, nine morning till five at night. Here's a memorial. Uh, at the Wall River. And again, Corporal Holly's unit received another presidential cita unit citation for the assault of the Nanagan Bridge under uh, the end of the The second battalion was given the opportunity or the responsibility of taking the west side of, or the east side of the Nanagan Bridge. The 504 had been crossed the wall come across. So that's where uh, my father's uh, presidential unit citation is. So that was the second one? That was the second one. Okay. Sadly, another of the eight died of wounds October 1st, 1944, during the market garden battle, Private Charles Wesley. On to another battle, the fifth and final big battle of World War II that these eight men were involved in. General Gavin received a phone call from uh, Eisenhower's headquarters on the 18th, and said that, uh, or on the 17th, and said that the Germans had broken through the RPN, and at the, at the time, uh, uh, Matthew Ridgway was in the end planning for next spring's and, uh, airborne operations, and uh, the 101st Airborne's uh, Commander was actually in the state, so Gavin took both divisions and uh, prepared them to get ready to move to uh, Stone. And the first thing Gavin did, hopped in a jeep for four men. He said, "I got to know where I'm sending my men." So he drove to Bastogne. Then after that, he drove up to the northern shoulder, up to a place called. Uh, he met with Courtney Hodges, uh, First Army, who was being ev evacuated to, uh, I believe, it was uh, Charfontaine, France. And that's when uh, Courtney Hodges said the best way to handle to uh, handle a huge uh, bulge like this is uh, both shoulders. So Gavin then rode back down to Bastogne where he met the 82nd Airborne at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he said one unit's going to go north, the other one's going to stay here at 
as the fast going. And the 80 second just happened to be, had gotten to the motor pool first. They were in the lead, so Gavin sent them north of the north shoulder, and uh, the 101st would stay down at uh, Bastogne, and everybody has heard of Bastogne, and, and basically it was, a, it was like five boats came in there, and Gavin said if anybody can hold this, it would be the 101st airborne, because they fought right next to the 82nd in, in uh, Normandy and in Holland, so, uh, and at that time, Gavin would, they had no idea who they were facing, but they knew there was a lot of artillery, and they faced the 1st, 2nd, 9th, 12th, and uh, 67th group uh, Volks Grenadier Division. But they were SS Division, and uh, Gavin came, uh, you can see they had uh, 60,000 men, 150 tanks, and Gavin had 8,800 men, and they only, the reason they had so few, they hadn't gotten replacements from Operation Market Guard. So they went up there and they found four towns and bridges across Salmon and Lee River, and they had 8,800 men, and they had 12 57-millimeter anti tank there's a map of the Battle of Bulge. You can see why it's called the Battle of Bulge, because the Germans actually did create a huge, huge line over a lot of geography. Again, sadly, two more will be killed. December 21st, 1944, during the Battle of Bulge, Sergeant Stokes Taylor, Lieutenant Jacob Brick, killed in action at the patrol point, patrol point, Belgium. Both men were awarded the DSC, our nation's second highest honor. There's a plaque commemorating them. Where is this plaque? The Trois Ponts. Oh, yes, right there. So at this point, of the eight men, as you've surmised, Corporal Holly was the lone survivor. Rick Spotter. I'll back up a little bit. Mel Dahlberg, what does Twapont mean? Three bridges. <laughs> How do you know that? That's where I was. That's where you were. What day were you wounded? January 3rd, 45. When did the battle end? When did the battle end? When did it end? Yeah. Middle of January. What do you mean? Just for the bridge? Shortly after that. Shortly after that. That's right. We told. I went to the hospital for 30 days. Okay. After you were wounded? And you... So they were extensive wounds. They were quite serious wounds that you contracted. Concussions. Twapon is like to say three bridges. There were three bridges there. Stomont, Twapon, and my dad was at a, at a bridge called Hamelmont. It was a smaller bridge. Uh, and there, uh, man, the caliber, when I went over there, uh, our friend from Belgium took me to the bridge and they took a metal detector and they dug up 30 and 50 caliber casing. So from December 21st, 1944 until March 1945 was the duration of the Battle of the Bulge. On March 1st, 1945, the 82nd Airborne was officially relieved from the division's final battle of World War II. In that battle alone, the Airborne suffered over uh, 4,000 men killed, injured, wounded, missing in action. Where were those uh, ones KIA buried? We're going to get to that. Well, you're probably asking why of the 16 million that were in World War II, 11 million in the Army, 24,000 in the Airborne, 12,000 in the 82nd. Why are we just talking about eight? The reason is June 2000. Corporal Leon Holly, Rick's father, was the lone survivor of these eight soldiers. And just before he passed away in the year 2000, he would write this. Platoon Sergeant Stokes Taylor, Lieutenant 
Jake Wordick, Private Charles Ressler, Sergeant Wilson, my first squad leader, and three other squad members were killed in Normandy. Someone should remember these men. And that's exactly what Rick has done over the past few years, visiting each of the grave great sites of the seven who were his father's fallen fellow warriors. These men were not just the st statistics, not just seven of the 400,000 who perished in that ferocious war, but seven men who deserve to be remembered. Corporal Leon Holly would be so proud that his son is doing just that. And this is where Rick has gone to remember these seven fallen soldiers. Rick. Sergeant Bernard. Sergeant Bernard Wilson was killed at St. Sauveur. There was his wedding picture, September 1941. Uh, he was from uh, Zanesville, Ohio. The man up at the top on the right was Ray Fari. Uh, actually, I met him in a reunion, the 82nd Airborne Reu Reunion, 2011. I showed him the list of names, and he said, let's start with Bilge. And then uh, down in uh, 2014, uh, the men People down at the right were members of the C-47 club, and I showed them the list of names also, and they said, if you're going to go there, we're going to go with you. So they wanted to find these men. Corporal Paul Snyder, uh, he was uh, from Oha uh, LaGrange, Kentucky, sorry. And where is he buried? These are, these are at the cemetery behind Omaha Beach. There at the cemetery at Omaha, we, we had the pictures of all four men, uh, including uh, the grave site of where Private Harold Huston was. And here again is the picture of where Harold Husk fell in his helmet. And the picture at the very bottom is of um, his grandparents. He was raised by his grandparents. Last fall, my, I and my wife went to Holland and uh, we crossed off the final name of my dad's list. Uh, Private Charles Ressler, we're at the American Cemetery at Marga. Stokes Taylor killed at Tuapont. Uh, there we are at uh, Orisha Pell Cemetery, and the young man there, uh, his, his parents and his grandparents have adopted the grave. Uh, this he's the third generation to adopt it. Lieutenant Wurdick, same way, uh, Henri Chappelle Cemetery, and uh, there Ray and I are at the grave site. Those members are all of the 505 Regimental Combat Team who were killed in the Battle of the Bulge. It's uh, right next to uh, Wurdick and Taylor's at 12 months. It's a picture of General Gavin welcoming the men back from the Ardennes Battle of Bulge to a well-deserved rest December 17th to February 20th in the country of Belgium and Germany. The 82nd Airborne would suffer 4,623 killed, injured, wounded, and missing in action. My father spoke of Gavin many times because he was on machine gun squad and so he'd guard headquarters, sometimes battalion headquarters. Uh, we're near uh, the division, and uh, he always said about this about Gavin. Yeah, he never sent us, he let us. So I just added some uh, pictures of the, the various cemeteries where Americans are buried. This is a Sicily Rome American cemetery. Graves of more than 7,800 war dead, and nearly 3,100 names on the walls of the missing. And this is Normandy, probably the most famous of the cemeteries. 90, almost 9,400 of our military dead um, from the Battle of uh, Normandy D-Day. And this is in the Netherlands, Mark Rotten. This is the only American cemetery in the Netherlands. Now we come from the um, Market Garden in the Netherlands. And this is in Belgium, is that correct? Correct, that's on Belgium. Mm -hmm. Almost 8,000 members of the military died in World War II. 
So again, why does Rick do this? To remember. We never ever want to forget these eight men and millions more who fought and are still fighting. Some who have given the ultimate sacrifice for us. And that's the end of our presentation. Any questions? Yes? Do the uh, German people have a similar presentation for their dead soldiers? Are they even know where they're at? How many cemeteries are there? The Germans? Yeah. Well, oh, I would imagine. There's a German cemetery near Normandy. Um, yeah, I don't know. Mary, I can comment on that. I was stationed in Germany twice, and the German cemeteries are very much like ours, uh, graves uh, all marked um, and very well kept. Um, another interesting fact, in between World War I and World War II, when, when the Germans took over um, France, they actually maintained our cemeteries for us. And we did the same for them. And that's a little known fact, but uh, they had great respect for their war dead as well as ours, and vice versa, when we were uh, over there too. So I did as much as I could uh, during my flight schedule doing historical things. And that's one thing that really I guess surprised me to a point, but uh, uh, how the different sides between wars kept each other's cemeteries um, and maintained them respectful. So. I'd like to thank Mary for bringing my dad's story to light. You're welcome. And uh, I'd really like to thank you all for this. three U.S. cemeteries, including the one my cousin's buried at, Andre Chappelle, and we visited three German graveyards also. They just aren't kept up quite as nicely as ours are, but the grass is mown and uh, they're not as big either. But... The cemeteries in Holland are impeccable. The Dutch people are just fanatics about it, and even though they are, you know, American cemeteries, they have been adopted by the Dutch people, and they are just, and, and in Poland as well. When I went to Poland and found the the site of Lut uh, Stalag Hor, or Earl, what Earl Joswick was, the Polish people had all kinds of flowers around the memorial, so they are very, very well um, kept. And the French, yes. I want to introduce my cousin Randy and his wife Sue, and Randy has brought some M1s and various other rifles. So please go over and take a look. And he said, You can handle them. He did take the ammo out, so they're <laughs> safe. <laughs> oh, rats, yeah. What other questions? Great. Right. I just want to mention the eight air force is not. 26,000 Absolutely. You just ask Rick about that and what, what the guys on the ground say about the 8th Air Force. It's kind of interesting because in, in Normandy, uh, when we visited, one of my favorite pictures were there's a, a photo of St. Mary Police on fire. There's a long line of Germans and tanks heading towards St. Mary Police. And here are P 47, P 51s, and B 26 Marauders coming to treetop height in the, the sign of the painting. Uh, hold on 82nd, the 8th is on its way. And it, it, to me, that said everything. And also, it, it, in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, they've been there six days, and all of a sudden the sky is finally clear. They, they were there from the 18th to about the 24th, 25th, and the sky is clear, and they, could, they couldn't resupply the men. And the 82nd came in with two days food, two days ammunition. On the 26th, the sky is clear, and uh, <coughs> Down in Bastogne, they use C-47s to drop it because that's a round area to the parachute. But where the 82nd Airborne, their line was like this. And so Lewis Brereton called up, Ridgeway called Brereton up and told Brereton, you've got to put those supplies right in our lap. Our line is really jagged. And he says, done. So Brereton asked for B-17 pilots.
had, and those guys came in the treetop height on the 26th and dropped supplies to the men of the 82nd Airborne. And the Ridgeway said, uh, the men owe the 8th Air Force something. And Gavin put it better. He says, next time you see an 8th Air Force man, 82nd guy, you buy him a drink. <laughs> and I'm sure they were. Roger. Uh, for those who would like to see uh, one of those gliders, uh, two members of the Rawlings chapter built one, or really restored one, and it's available at the museum at Granite Falls. Yeah, Jim Johns, I remember. The tail of that thing is 40, the tip of the tail is 46 feet above the ground. That's how big those things were. Huge. Absolutely. Very Blue. I spent 10 years in Germany and the German cemeteries are not man manicured like ours. The main reason they aren't is they lost the war. <laughs> That's no excuse. That's the main reason. That people don't pay the respect to the, like we do. Glenn. 10 years ago I visited a German cemetery in Belgium. It was a mass grave. Really? Right. This, this pile of bodies under the dirt. And there were some tombstones all picked over. The government went to the Belgian people and asked them, we'll pay you, local farmers, if you will uncover that and make it a nice grave site. And the Belgian people went against them and said, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to leave it like it is. Sure, they lost the war. Yeah. If you go to Belgium, you'll uh, not too far from Armory Chappelle. There is a German cemetery. And uh, they asked me, how many do you think are out there? And I said, probably, looks like six, 7,000 headstones. And he said, no, there are 42,000 men buried. What they do is they take a headstone of German, and they put six bodies around it. And it might crack down. So they're unidentified. Correct. Many, many, many unidentified. And also, in Germany, unidentified. also in Germany, you don't see veterans wearing jackets like we do, even going back. They, they want to erase it because they weren't involved in the war. They lost. And that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. You'll never see anybody wearing SS. You will see some uh, reenactors wearing yeah. German uniform, but not SS. That is banned. Any other questions? My father never talked about World War II. Did he, Mom? No. Never did. Never said a word. It was like. But you should have seen him every day, every year, 4th of July, D-Day, or three times he got quiet, he'd say, tomorrow, D-Day. And then uh, he said it was a sunny day when he went into Operation Market Garden. And then the battle book, he said it was, tonight we went into the yard end. And then he'd get quiet for about two days. Hey. My late uncle, Raymond Fogers, from, he was over there with Pat the group. He never talked about it because what he saw was not to be seen coming into the camps and everything. He said, he said, it was, he said I, never, I never wanted to talk about it. Many, many didn't. And we're grateful for the ones that did. And we're grateful for your father for the, the two sentences. Someone should remember these men. And you did, and you spent many, many years tracking them down, probably hundreds and hundreds of hours, finding pictures and relatives to remember these men. And especially Husk, who has no family, was raised by his grandparents, his mother was nowhere to be found, you could not find a picture of him. And so someone has remembered him, as well as the others. Uh, there was a police officer in our local hometown uh, that interviewed my father, and he had the same list and the same, after my father passed away, he said, Rick, I'm going to show you something, and it said the same thing. Uh, someone should remember these men, and I found that list in my dad's 82nd Airborne book, that big red one back there. So. Yeah, tell us about that book, The Saga. It's, uh, it came out in, what, 1946. Rick had, Rick's father had one, and not all the 87 people. Did you get one? No? It's called The Saga? Not all of them got these books, but Rick's father did, and he just kind of put it away, didn't he? And then Rick would sneak in and take a look at it. But it is a wonderful, wonderful book. I got one on Amazon. Of course, it's not one of the originals. It's just a reproduction. 
but Rick's, it, it has everything about the 82nd, and it's just a fabulous book, and Rick's dad had that since 1946. I saw one on for sale the other day, and it cost $600. Yeah. So. It's got the whole history of it. Any other questions? Well, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.